Coming up on the Civil Discourse, writer and essayist Thomas Chatterton Williams discusses his books, Racial Identity, Cancel Culture, and a controversial Letter on Justice and Open Debate to Harper's Magazine that stirred controversy and moved the conversation forward. I don't necessarily dislike somebody disagreeing. It's more, is this in good faith? Are we, are we both trying to get to a, a, a better place of mutual understanding? Or is this ad hominem? And, and, and ad hominem, I kind of just dismiss. Hello and welcome to the Civil Discourse. I'm your host, Paula Morantz Cohn, Dean of the Pannoni Honors College at Drexel University, speaking to you from my home in Center City, Philadelphia. Today, my guest is the author and public intellectual, Thomas Chatterton Williams. Mr. Williams, who's joining us from Paris, is a former contributing writer for the New York Times Magazine and columnist for Harper's, and is currently a contributor to The Atlantic. He's also the author most recently of Self-Portrait in Black and White, Unlearning Race. Thomas Chatterton Williams, welcome to the Civil Discourse. It's a pleasure to be here. So I wanna start with your name. Thomas Chatterton was an 18th century poet said to be brilliantly promising but poor, who died by suicide at 17 and became an inspiration and touchstone for the romantics. And I have two questions, one is, why did your parents give you this name? And secondly, how does it feel to have this name? And do people tend to you know, do double takes or make comments about it? My father is a black man from Galveston, Texas, uh, grew up under segregation. He really grew up in a different America than I did. Fatherless uh, boy trying to make his way through the world. And he came across, and he doesn't remember exactly where he came across, but he came across the story of Thomas Chatterton. And this fatherless, uh, this fatherless white boy from Bristol, England, led a life that seemed um, relatable to my dad. Here was a kid that wanted to use his mind, really wanted to excel with words and ideas and you know became the kind of poster boy of neglected genius i don't think my father was being arrogant and thinking of himself as some incredible genius but he was thinking of himself as someone with talent who wanted to do some things and who society was kind of not um nurturing and not uh not helping and and there were a lot of circumstances and conditions that were maybe blocking him from um realizing all of his dreams he obviously was far more resilient than Thomas Chatterton. <laughs> he was very <laughs> resilient. And yeah. Thomas Chatterton, you know, there's some disagreement about whether maybe he died accidentally. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But it's interesting that he gave you that name and you have gone on to become a, a very talented and prolific writer. I want to ask you about your, your first interestingly titled book, Losing My Cool. Love, Literature, and a Black Man's Escape from the Crowd. Growing up, you were very drawn to hip hop and to being cool, so to speak, and that you felt compelled to leave that behind. It, it was somehow antithetical to your intellectual growth. And could you elaborate a little bit on this? That was a book that came with some controversy, but resonated with a lot of Black audiences that I spoke to. Um, I grew up in the 80s and the 90s. And during this time, there was, for my friends and I, there was a sense that there was a kind of racial authenticity that came through a performance of a kind of street credibility, if that makes sense. But there was something that, um, you know, there was a, we were defining ourselves in many ways in opposition to, to mainstream notions of success. There was this type of, you know, culture of, of not acting white, which is something that you're really not supposed to, to talk about now. You're not supposed to say that that was a real thing, but it really was, at least in the environment that I grew up in. And so I ended up leading a kind of double life where I tried to project a kind of Black masculinity that was legible 
in the hip hop vernacular, and that oftentimes uh, meant acting tough, acting in ways that would be typically misogynistic, playing down an interest in the mind, playing up interest in, in, in physical prowess, whether that be athletic or what have you. And then at home with my dad, who, who told me that I was going to bring honor to this uh, dead poet's name, I was, um, I, <laughs> I was hitting the books and kind of hiding that from my peer group. That's so interesting. Did your father know about this so-called double life that you were leading or did you hide it from him? Hid it as much as I could, but he was a savvy observer. And I think he would keep me on a kind of leash, but he would give me some, some leeway. Um, and I think that was the only way that he thought, you know, we could balance this tightrope because we were not really growing up in the cultural environment that he had hoped for. So he was trying to, he was trying to navigate several challenges at once. And I think it really worked well that way. He sounds like an extraordinary man. Your next book or your most recent book is Self-Portrait in Black and White. And I think this also stirred controversy. You're married to a white woman, you discuss this, and your daughter is blonde and blue eyed. And you say that on the one hand, you're pleased that she will escape some of the racism that you faced and uh, certainly your father, but that on the other hand, you feel bad that she's cut off in certain ways from her black identity. You parse these issues and it's, they're complicated and you know, it's hard to deal with nuance nowadays. And I wonder what you think about the response you've gotten to this book. There was actually like a pretty positive mainstream response in the New York Times and other places. Um, but that was just before the racial reckoning of 2020 that came in May. And I'm left with the impression that were it to have been published a year later, it would have been a very different situation because a lot of that nuance um, became impermissible. It's not that I felt here I have a white daughter. It's that I thought if I'm a black man who can have a child that looks like this and this child can be 25% West African descended, what do these racial categories that we profess to believe in even mean? And, how, and if they're not able to contain the complexity of, of us, I suspect that they don't really describe uh, anyone else either. But so many of us don't come up against the limits of, of the racial logic that we don't really question it. We just keep reproducing this um, way of thinking of, our, of ourselves that comes to us from, from the plantation, from slavery. A drop of black blood makes a person black because Black is some essence. And so really her birth for me was the beginning of realizing that, um, really understanding that race was a fiction in a way that I didn't even by having a white mother and a black father in my own childhood. I mean, what do you say when people say that, they, that you've been co-opted by white culture or that you're denying something yeah. that perhaps you haven't experienced as strongly as others with different backgrounds that share your race? Well, I guess I don't believe there's a racial category to share. I think there's ethnic and cultural mm. aspects of our American experience that make sense. Um, and I would, I guess I would push back and just say that it's true that there is like skin bias. Absolutely. Um, there's colorism within the black community. There's a kind of privilege of having lighter skin. I wouldn't, and it maybe makes rejecting racial categorization easier. But I also know very dark skinned blacks who, um, who, who reject it as well, who reject the language and the logic of race as well. So I don't think it's something that necessarily has to depend on privilege. And you know, the privilege argument is, it can get absurd. I mean, going back to your first question, so many people who criticize, they think that being named Thomas Chatterton Williams is a sign of my class privilege. <laughs> they think that being named after this penniless <laughs> poet yeah whose name sounds English is, is because I'm somehow from the upper class. It couldn't be further from the truth. So oftentimes, you know. It does sound, uh, Thomas, it does sound a little bit that way. He was an <laughs> impoverished poet who committed suicide or perhaps not, maybe. But nonetheless, it does sound very highbrow British. Yeah, I think, I mean, appearances can be deceiving. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> I mean, I wonder, are you adept at argument because I imagine that people come and want to challenge you about some mm -hmm. of your ideas and that you come across them all the time, both in the media and in academia, which are, of course, the two areas where many of these ideas that oppose what you're saying flourish. So I wonder how at ease are you with, with argument and uh, do you feel you do a good job bringing down the temperature? 
I try on social media and I think that, you know, that's hit or miss. It, 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 it's a tougher medium through which yeah. you come across as nuanced and reasonable. And, and also your whole personality doesn't shine through. Um, but in person, I think I do. I also think that I have an unusually high appetite for argument, um, <laughs> which comes from, again, comes from my father's house where, where I to tell you that the sky is blue outside, my brother and my father might make you have to have to back that up. <laughs> they wouldn't just <laughs> let that comment go. So yeah. I just think that, you know, I don't necessarily get bothered by people pushing back. I think some of the smartest um, responses to things I've written have been actually negative or critical responses. Some of the most thought provo provoking responses. I don't necessarily dislike somebody disagreeing. It's more, um, is this in good faith? Are we, are we both trying to get to a a better place of mutual understanding, or is this ad hominem? And, and, and ad hominem, I kind of just dismiss. So I have another question for you. Reading your books and some of your essays, I noticed that you are, you like comparisons between works that you think have depth and works that you think are more superficial. Hip hop and great books, Carrie James Marshall and Kahinda Wiley, Beyonce and Nina Simone, for example. And I wonder about this comparative approach. Do you find it productive um, to weigh value in art? And it certainly goes against certain trends in postmodernism, which has trend tended to level things or look at things from the point of view as a text within culture. So I wonder about, are you aware of the degree to which you compare, you create hierarchies? That's a very astute comment because some of my closest friends over the years going back to college and my wife have said that I do that as well and not simply in writing, but I kind of have a mind, I think, that um, that's what the Stoics might say is a way, or the Buddhists, is, is a way to unhappiness, but I constantly compare. <laughs> well, I do it too. That's why I think I'm very aware of it. And it's not necessarily the healthiest way, but it is it's a way true. of organizing one's view of life. And I also think getting back to something else you said, it's temperamental too, mm -hmm. you know, it's yeah. sort of in one's DNA. It is. And I think I do um, have a hierarchical um, disposition, not to say that people are worth more or less than other people, but that some things are better and worse than other things. I really believe that in terms of culture, I really believe that in terms of ideas, I don't think everything is on equal footing. I think it's quite obvious that some ideas are enduring for a reason, some are misleading for a reason, and that the, the job of the writer, otherwise you should do something else that's much more lucrative, the job of the writer is to try to figure out how to weigh and then how to persuade and compel others to see what is more valuable or less value so that they might make slightly better judgments themselves. That's the work, I think, and that's what called me to the work. I agree, and I think that's the work of education. And Absolutely. Be. That's an education. Yes. And I think being a writer is being a lifelong student, actually, and then sharing, sharing what you find. Especially as a public intellectual, which is what I called you. And I think that there are some now there, perhaps there was a kind of hiatus of, of that type of person for a while, but I think we're beginning to see more of them. And their job is to educate the culture through their writings in these various media outlets. And it's a hard job, I think, right now when we have a climate that's a little more uninflected. And I worry about students coming out of universities with, you know, one dimensional ideas. They're going to have a hard time reading mm -hmm. you. Um, and, and social media doesn't really encourage that either. One thing that I really dislike about social media is the flattening effect where you can have an extraordinarily incisive post followed by something completely meaningless, absurd, and even something factually untrue, all presented evenly as exactly the same, just information flowing one after another. I think that that's been destabilizing for our, for our public conversation. So I wanna to talk to you a little bit about France. You're in Paris right now. How have you found the French as opposed to the Americans in terms of tolerance and openness and so forth? I mean, can you make a comparison between the two cultures? It's a good question. It's maybe somewhat difficult for me to answer because the French are extraordinarily kind and welcoming to an American, and I think specifically to 
Americans who work in certain fields that they tend to admire, like especially Americans from certain regions like New York. So I don't have the experience of, of an immigrant from necessarily any background or any, um, any geography. So my, my experience has been that the French are, are, are extremely welcoming and open to, to myself. In one of your books, I think you write that you're taken sometimes for an Algerian. I had been when I was yeah. younger. The first time I came to France, I lived in, in the north on the Belgian border in a city called Lille. Oh, and, I uh, lived in Lille for a year. Oh, really? Yes, really? for a whole oh. year. I we have that in common. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. I had a very, I was, this was a long time ago before Lille became more fashionable. There were no uh, Americans. It did become a bit better, yeah. Yeah, but it also had an interesting connection. You know, there were a lot of collaborationists in Lille at the time, and I'm Jewish, so I felt both welcomed, but also it was very odd, and I loved it there. I loved it, but it's that's interesting that you were in the that. The people sense. are known for being quite friendly there. Yeah. I taught, I, I was teaching, I was an assistant d'anglais in English language. That was so I. Really? Oh, it's because you did the program. We probably yes, did the Lycée program. Fenelon. Did you know the Lycée Fenelon? It was that an old girls' familiar, school. I was teaching, actually, I was commuting to teach in uh, Roubaix, which is a uh, yeah. working class Arab neighborhood. Uh -huh. And it was there that I was often, and I had my head shaved at the time, it was there that I often was um, racially mistaken for, for an Arab, because that's what my physical characteristics in that yeah. context presented as. Now that I live in Paris, and I think that, you know, there's a way that you're probably read based on who you're married to and who you're with, that, that, that changes the calculus. I don't think anyone has spoken to me in Arabic in a long time, but it used to happen to me in Lille all the time. I also wonder, though, I mean, the French do love ideas in a way Americans don't. So, um, you know, I think you come to this country, it's, it's an anti-intellectual country in many ways. I guess it depends on who you're circulating with but compared to the french where the taxi driver may that's right want to talk to you about some idea or some political thing uh that is very different in america there's kind of always been an anti-intellectualism and a disdain for eggheadism and and a kind of um lack of respect for um you know men and women of letters um so it's, it, it, but you know in america there are actually much larger rewards. There can be greater compensation in America and there, the, America has a larger stage. So there's this kind of common respect for ideas in France, but America is still the arena where everybody wants to go to. You mean where you can make it as a person? Yeah, and the but, French are reading the New York Times and they're paying attention uh, to those debates and, and, and both have aspects of themselves that are, you know, that are worth participating in. With my last book, Self-Portrait in Black and White, you know the, the 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 case that I was making that if race is not if race is not bio, biologically or scientifically meaningful, and it comes out of a history of um, racism, that we should we should move towards a colorblind universalism. That would be controversial now in America, and it was in France. It wasn't considered controversial. It was it was reviewed the same on the left and the right. It was just considered um, obviously. Um, the common sense point of view, and so it was. It was. It was such a different experience publishing that here, and I and I would say that actually the book was. Um, it was more successful in France than it was in America. Well, ten years ago in America, there might not have been the same pushback, right? That's right. Right. That's right. So it is interesting to see that you know the, how the culture has mutated or changed, and certainly the George Floyd murder was a turning point and a, you know, a galvanizing event in this country. I mean, you've written about this, but what is your view of the Black Lives Matter movement and as a corollary critical race theory, which are two things that, you know, do frame so much of the way a race is now being talked about and this whole issue of diversity, equity, and inclusion and that you know, is so central to so many universities. I think that Black Lives Matter did something very valuable, which was start and sustain a very necessary debate about the degree to which our criminal justice system is extraordinarily violent, especially in comparison to other wealthy Western democracies. I do think that it's not ultimately um, 
helpful to say that some lives or to to imply or to reify the abstraction that some lives are black and others are white. I think actually a movement that recognized that certain communities are targeted in certain ways, but a movement that was just on the universal principle that police brutality is unacceptable and implicates us all. And whether or not you believe your ethnic community is as implicated in it, you should pay attention to it because American citizens are being brutalized by police. I actually think that that would be a more enduring and powerful statement. I understand why it was framed the way it was, but relying on racial essentialism is counterproductive if what we actually want to do is ultimately transcend racism. The categories for me, they're not, you can't rehabilitate these categories that were given to us from, from the slave trade, from, from the plantation. So th I, those are my quibbles with it. In terms of critical race theory, I'm not an expert on it, but I think that I'm profoundly disturbed by the degree to which there was a very cynical um, use of the term by right-wing activists like Christopher Rufo um, to make it a bogeyman and to flatten all nuance and complexity from what are actually very sophisticated legal arguments. Is there something strange going on in the culture, in our schools? Is there, is there kooky teaching? Absolutely. Is it, is it specifically critical race theory? No, and Christopher Rufo and some of his allies, they, they actually admitted as much. They, they slapped this term onto a bunch of behaviors that would strike parents as questionable as, as a kind of negative branding that they would then pin on Democrats. And so the anti-CRT debate, it really exhausts me. And I think that we very seldomly get into um, a proper discussion of the ideas. If you wanted to do that, Henry Louis Gates Jr. in 1993, writing in the New Republic, already refuted all of the free speech um, inadequacies of critical race theory and did so quite brilliantly, but no one's having that kind of conversation. So I, I think it's so cynical that it's really, it's really difficult to, it's difficult to engage with. Yeah. Uh, you brought up the right and the way it distorts things. And I wonder about your feeling of yourself being distorted on the right. I mean, I, I do think some of your views are obviously going to be embraced or, or uh, held up by people on the right as, you know, against others on the left. And how do you feel about that? And, and where do you place yourself politically? I've always voted Democrat. Um, I consider myself a liberal. I believe in, I believe in the primacy of the individual over the group. Um, I, I believe in maximal tolerance and, and exchange of ideas, open exchange of ideas, personal liberty. Um, it's kind of a testament to the degree to which the left has been hijacked by a kind of illiberal extremism that calls itself progressivism, that um, sensibilities that are fundamentally liberal are now out of sync. There are sensible ideas on both sides. Yeah. I actually think what goes on and calls itself conservative today, in many cases, is not very conservative at all. It's, it's quite radical. Um, there's nothing to me conservative about Donald Trump, for example. One last question, because we're running out of time, but you were one of the authors of the letter on justice and open debate that appeared in Harper's, it was signed by many artists and intellectuals and authors, and then it had some pushback, you know, it was about free speech, essentially, and the fact that they're protesting some of these limits that have been placed on the way people express themselves or debate. And uh, some of the signatories, I think, withdrew their names from the letter. And I, I wonder if you understand the objections voiced on the other side and if you're sympathetic toward it. Yeah, to my knowledge, only one historian actually withdrew. And one other said that had she known JK Rowling was signing, she wouldn't have signed, but she didn't withdraw. Um, the historian who withdrew, um, I understood her motivations, but I didn't respect them because she essentially was very enthusiastic, and we have the emails of the correspondence, she was very enthusiastic about the text of the document and, and, and said multiple times that she was proud to sign her name. And then she got hard pushback from her peer group. And then 
she herself is not trans, but I believe that there may have been a trans family member that she cited was very offended because J.K. Rowling had signed the letter and her public position, which we did not contradict, was that her assistant had signed, had put her name on the letter and she had never seen it. But, but you know otherwise, yeah. That to me was just a testament to the real pressure that academics and writers are under to, to conform or to perform a kind of conformity. And it's, and it's, it's exactly what the letter was trying to push back against. One of the greatest uh, responses I saw was Malcolm Gladwell, who was one of the signatories. And he said, you know, there's a ton of people in here I don't agree with. And that was exactly my motivation for signing the letter. Here's something, that, here's some, here's, here's some basic principles that we can all agree on. <laughs> I wonderful, thought it was the point. Wonderful point. Anyway, I, I, we're out of time and I want to thank you. I mean, the thoughtfulness and the, uh, the really interesting way in which you express your ideas is, is so impressive. So thanks for joining us today, Thomas Chatterton. Thank you Williams. so much. It was a pleasure to talk to you. And thank you, our audience, for, for joining us on the civil discourse.